Assistance Center, and I'd like to welcome and I'd like to welcome you to the Children and Family Treatment and Support Refresher webinar. Today we will be joined by our state partners who will walk us through the three new services that are scheduled to go live in January. And just as a reminder, those services are other licensed practitioner, community psychiatric supports and treatment, and psychosocial rehab. I'd like to start off by just reviewing a few housekeeping items. The slides will be posted at our, on our website after today's presentation. Uh, and just a reminder that while it may be helpful to refer to these slides, they are not the official document and you will need to refer to the provider and billing manuals for official guidance. Also, the information presented is current as of today. Today's presentation will include a brief overview um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a brief review of the pathways to care, uh, service descriptions and case examples, resources, and if time allows, we'll have a brief Q&A period. So we're gonna ask that you please submit your questions utilizing the chat box feature at any point during the webinar. We would also like to remind everyone that we have a number of existing resources related to the children's transition on our website. So we encourage you to review these resources um, and additionally, we will be having two upcoming webinars related to billing. One is on November 16th, one is on November um, 15th. So we just ask that you look out for the announcement and registration for these trainings. And with that, I will now pass it over to our state partners to get started. Good afternoon. Before we go further in the slide presentation, I'll introduce myself and let my co-presenter introduce herself. I'm Maria Morris Groves and I have the privilege of being the Adolescent Women and Children's Team Lead at OASIS on Children and Families Issues. Um, and hi, this is Meredith Ray Labatt, and I'm uh, with the New York State Office of Mental Health in our Division of Integrated Community Services for Children and Families. Um, and I uh, work very closely with uh, my partner here, Maria morris Grove. Okay, and um, just by way of uh, other introductions, our, our third triumph that folks are used to seeing um, is unable to be with us, um, but we do have staff from the Office of Children and Family Services here to be able to fill questions, and I'm sure that Allison will do a wonderful job filling in for Mimi when the time comes. So if we can go to the next slide. So just real briefly, most of you probably already have these eight dates committed, but um, January 1, we're gonna roll in other licensed practitioner, psychosocial rehab, and community psych supports and treatment to the state managed care plan. And then in July, we'll roll in family peer support. And out in January 2020, we'll bring in youth peer support and training and crisis intervention. So that's just a brief review of those dates. Some key points for you to think about as you're looking at how you're going to implement these services. These are just that, they are services. They're standalone. They're not part of any existing service or program, um, but they're services. These services can be accessed individually or in a coordinated comprehensive manner when identified in the treatment plan. The provide, they provide children and youth must, must include communication and coordination with family, caregiver, and other legal guardians. So they're really meant to encompass the whole family and youth aspect of the work that we do. We also need to coordinate with other child serving systems so that we can achieve the ultimate treatment goals. In order to be eligible for the Children and Family Treatment and Support Services, an organization must be designated by a provider by submitting an application. The link that is in your PowerPoint is the link that will allow you to begin to do that work. These, these practitioners that we just talked about must operate within a designated agency. Other a couple things important to know. Each new child and family and treatment and support service will have a very distinct agency qualifications, individual staff qualifications as to who can deliver the services, supervisory qualifications, required trainings, there is also billing requirements, medical necessity and limits and exclusions. They can all be found in the Children and Family and Support Services Manual. The link is there, but it's also available on the DOH Children's Managed Care website. So I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith now to talk about Pathways to Care. Oh, I can do okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to do pathways of care. So there are many ways that children can access services. 
They can utilize these services um, as they're needed. They're meant to be um, individualized, and they're meant to be at any point in a child's developmental practitioner track developmental path. Yes. <laughs> um, Thank you. That can Thank identify you. the behavioral need. They can, behavioral health need can be identified by multiple sources. So those sources can include the parents and their caregivers, a pediatrician, care managers from um, health homes or other places, the school personnel, clinicians, or the young person themselves. Anyone can make a referral, but the recommendation and the service provision must be made by a licensed practitioner who can discern and document medical necessity criteria. So what we mean is the referral source, much like you might get a referral to an orthopedic or another type of practitioner, and anybody could make that referral. It could be your primary care doctor, it could be the ER doc when you go in with a, 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 an incident that's occurred. But the person that's going to recommend and develop that plan is gonna be a licensed practitioner that's related to that orthopedic piece. So it's very similar for this behavioral health concern. The referral can come from a wide variety of places, um, but it could also be, it has to be recommended by a licensed treating practitioner of the healing arts. They can document the particular need of that youth or child based on completed assessments and documents. And then they'll look at medical necessity criteria for that specific service, including the service on, and include the service on the child and youth treatment plan. So again, referral is anybody in the general public can make that referral and the recommendation by the licensed practitioner of the healing art. Now this slide is probably a good one to have the, the licensed practitioner of healing arts include all of those folks that are listed there. Listed there. The practitioners listed under OLP as um, natural, natural practitioner of license fee OLP for additional information. So this is taken directly from the MASPA manual, and as we talk about OLP, we'll talk about all of the folks that can make those recommendations for that service. This added folks to the state plan services. Okay? So pathway. Just to kind of show it visually, Anyone can refer, so they make, a, they make a referral, let's just say they make a referral to a licensed clinical social worker operating in one of the, the services. They have up to three visits to work with the child and family to assess and develop a treatment plan and to contact the managed care plan. At the same time, concurrent review and authorization needs to occur before the fourth visit. We can begin providing some services during those three visits if the complete assessment and developmental plan is less is, is done within less those less than those three visits. So now we're going to talk about that other licensed practitioner is the person as the person who can really recommend the service and help um, develop that treatment plan. Great. Thanks, Maria. Um, so again, this is Meredith Ray Labatt from the New York State Office of Mental Health. I'm going to be talking to you about some of the services, uh, other licensed practitioner and community psychiatric uh, supports and treatment. First off, um, we're going to be talking about OLP. Uh, very strange name for a service, but we'll talk more in depth about what it actually is. Um, why offer OLP? And so uh, I think in the course of uh, the Medicaid redesign efforts, uh, what we were hoping to do with this service was really provide a degree of flexibility uh, for access to licensed practitioners for children and families. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, licensed practitioners are really only available within uh, certain programs or within a clinic, and sometimes uh, wait lists can get quite long, or sometimes um, those types of settings are not to the in, um, providing services in the way that are best suited for those children and families. And so they really needed something more flexible and uh, more suited to their needs. And so OLP really is intended to help uh, providers to be able to more effectively engage those children and families and also to um, really help to provide those services in a variety of, of other non-traditional settings like those that might be provided within a, the four walls of a clinic. So these services could be provided in uh, natural settings, in the home, in the community, um, and wherever really children and families are uh, that are suited to their preference and to their needs. So uh, other, other licensed practitioner services can prevent the progression of behavioral health needs through early intervention and identification. 
Um, and they also may be provided uh, for children who are not yet diagnosed. So really having the opportunity to access someone who has within the scope of their practice the ability to diagnose in a more flexible way in a variety of settings um, provides a greater flexibility within the system. And so if children are initially identified as having a need, uh, an OLP, or later we'll talk about them as NBP, LBHP, I'll, I'll let you know what that is at that time. Um, <laughs> uh, those folks can, uh, again, with, if it's within their scope of practice, can really uh, help to assess children and families wherever they are and discern um, whether they have a, a diagnosis and a, and a significant behavioral health need that needs a certain intervention. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I think I really covered all this. This is to be provided in the home and the community and other uh, potentially site-based settings where appropriate, but flexibly uh, could be wherever the children and family need them to be or wherever they prefer to be. Um, and they, uh, all the services that are provided under the scope of OLP are also need to ha be provided within the scope of the practitioner's practice. So while there's a wide variety of these practitioners, which we will talk about now, very good. <laughs> um, uh, each of them kind of have a, a slight differentiation in their scope of practice. And so it might, how they provide services and what services they provide or the way in which they provide them might vary slightly. But um, the categories of practitioners who can provide OL, other licensed practitioner services are called non-physician licensed behavioral health practitioners. So that's that weird acronym that I mentioned earlier, NPLDHP. And there are five clinical categories that are allowed to provide uh, these services. Those are licensed psychoanalysts, licensed clinical social workers, licensed marriage and family therapists, licensed mental health counselors, and licensed master social workers, but only when they're under the supervision of a licensed clinical social worker or a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist. And so licensed master social work workers cannot work independent outside of the supervision of one of those other licensed practitioner categories. Um, so while we are allowing, obviously, um, these, practitioners, these practitioners to provide an OLP service, they must operate within a designated agency. So the, uh, these practitioners can only provide these services and be reimbursed under, the, under Medicaid if they are within a state-designated OLP agency, so to speak. So what are these services that I keep referencing, these OLP services? Um, very strange term to say OLP services, but these are the basically um, most of the service categories that are traditionally uh, provided by these types of licensed practitioners within their scope of practice. So we're going to be talking about them uh, next. Uh, one of which obviously is a license evaluation and assessment. Um, uh, again, a licensed practitioner can do a, a assessment of a child. They can do a comprehensive assessment. Again, if it's within their scope of practice, they can also establish a diagnosis. So uh, licensed clinical social workers or licensed master social workers under the supervision of um, I think have a diagnosis capacity within their scope of practice. But generally, all of the licensed practitioners can conduct an assessment uh, of the child and help to identify services and uh, discern that these services that are available through the, state, through the state plan, these children and family treatment support services, as we're calling them, CTFSS, um, that they meet medical necessity for the receipt of these services. And so they can discern that and they can confirm the medical necessity and they can make a recommendation uh, for uh, any other service that they determine might be applicable to supporting that child, which includes uh, CPST and PSR, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, the other uh, service component is obviously treatment planning. What happens after you do an assessment and you identify the needs? You develop a treatment plan. <laughs> um, you identify the uh, varied needs that the child and family have. You identify the services that would best uh, be well suited to address those needs. You identify how those, how those needs are going to be addressed, right? So we call those goals and objectives. <laughs> um, you talk about what you'd like to achieve with um, those goals and objectives, and then you talk about, obviously, how uh, you anticipate that you, uh, the clinician and the family, identifying when those goals and objectives have been met and that child might be eligible for discharge. Um, in the course of doing a treatment plan, you also identify the frequency, scope, and duration of the treatment of the provider, and uh, this helps you guide what that licensed practitioner will do in the treatment that they're going to be conducting with that child and family. All right, psychotherapy. 
is a very overarching term of therapy. This could have many, many different, look in many, many different ways depending on what the child and family needs, but also depending on the specialized specialization of the licensed practitioner or the specialized training that they've received. Um, so obviously uh, the, the uh, uh, purpose of psychotherapy is really to address the identified needs of children and families. These are all very clinical descriptions of what psychotherapy is. But, um, but again, it could vary uh, depending on the needs of the child and family. It could be trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. It could be uh, solution-focused therapy. It's really uh, the, the approaches and the, and the nature in which uh, th these things are addressed are, are up to the skill set and the um, education of the practitioner. But basically, uh, they're going to help the child and family address all of the challenges that they've identified and uh, in accordance with the treatment plan. So the crisis intervention activities, um, basically uh, what these are is a capacity for a therapist to be uh, immediately responsive to children and families in the time of crisis. And so these are really just reimbursement uh, mechanisms <laughs> for a, a licensed practitioner to make themselves available and get reimbursed for it so that they can have the flexibility to be available to children and families um, at any given time, assuming that they can make themselves available. Um, for, for these services. And so these are um, crisis-oriented services that are designed to help address the, the child and family's needs. Um, great. And here they are. Okay, that's where they are. <laughs> I was like, I knew I saw them. Um, so here is just, uh, here they are listed, very easy. So crisis triage allows a practitioner to speak with the family or, uh, or uh, the place in which maybe the child is, if the child is in the ER, uh, to help address an immediate crisis, an acute, an acute distress situation, um, to help, uh, you know, be there for the family and address the situation. The crisis complex care allows that licensed practitioner to follow up with the family or follow up with the, um, uh, you know, the service provider who provided them maybe services within the course of that uh, crisis to talk about some ongoing uh, support and services that might be needed to, to really help the family to alleviate uh, their need, the, the, uh, the potential for a crisis in the future. Um, and so uh, the other one, uh, is there a third one? There's three crisis services described. <laughs> I just see two listed. Oh, it's crisis triage and then crisis offsite. I'm sorry, I missed that. I apologize. Um, crisis offsite obviously is the mech is the actual opportunity for the licensed practitioner to go and to be with the family in the in the course of a crisis to help support them if uh, if they so uh, determine it necessary and have the capacity to do so. They're going to go to the family's home or if they're going to go to meet the family, uh, you know, somewhere else in the community, um, they have the capacity to do so um, through this reimbursement mechanism as well. Sorry, I lost that for a second there. All right, so let's talk about someone who might need OLP. So Raymond. Raymond, who's four years old, and uh, which is exciting because, as you may know, since we, these services are now amongst the state plan within the uh, category of EPSTT, Early, uh, early Periodic uh, Screening, Diagnostic, and Treatment, uh, <laughs> that this, these services can be applicable to children from the ages of zero to 21. And so, um, so poor four-year-old Raymond is struggling. Uh, it looks like he's struggling with social skills and anxiety in preschool, and, and he's not being successful. And his family is really um, having difficulty attending school meetings to help him uh, and help to address these concerns. So Raymond's teacher is concerned that if this is not addressed and that, that if his symptoms increase, that it, it, it won't bode well for Raymond. So she, who has recently attended a great information session about uh, child and family treatment support services, which uh, was very exciting to her, thought that these services could really help Raymond if, uh, if they could be certainly provided in his home. So she refers the family to a local mental health provider agency whom she knows is a state designated provider for CFTSS services. <laughs> My embellishment. Whoa. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the local mental health agency receives a referral and they reach out to Raymond and his family and they make an appointment um, with their licensed mental health counselor who is a designated OLP in their agency to go uh, meet with them in their home. And, and based on uh, his or her assessment, 
um, the licensed practitioner has determined that the, um, the child would benefit from OLP services um, of, uh, as well as psychosocial rehab services. So, um, and, and, uh, and their, their feeling is though Raymond would benefit from that. So Raymond, but Raymond's not enrolled in managed care, so uh, just as a FYI, they don't have to notify the managed care plan, and they're not required to, uh, to do so be, uh, because um, they can bill fee-for-service. That's a little UM thrown in there for you. <laughs> um, so again, uh, initially the teacher, and the, since the child is four years old, did not um, uh, feel as though, uh, at that time he did not have a diagnosis. These are really an early intervention. But the OLP was able to serve uh, Raymond because uh, they, can, they can discern medical necessity and they can discern diagnosis potentially if need be, uh, and it's not required to get OLP assessment. The o, so the OLP then de de um, determines that he'll, he or she will work with Raymond in the community and provide psychotherapy to address the anxiety, but also engage with the, a psychosocial uh, rehabilitation provider or worker who will work with Raymond specifically on his um, interpersonal skills and how he might be able to start talking with other young children his age and make some friends and how he can interact with them more appropriately. Um, instead of biting and hitting potentially because he's four. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, uh, the OLP and the PSR are going to work very collaboratively together to assure that Raymond um, uh, is able to calm himself and develop the skills that he needs to be successful in preschool. Right. Little Raymond. Chitty, <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk now about community psychiatric treatment uh, uh, supports and treatment, or as Mimi would say, treatment and support. Hmm. She's not here. So again, why would we offer uh, CPST? So uh, again, you know, all of these new services are really intended to, to help provide flexibility for families and children to meet them where they are and to, uh, to provide services where they prefer and where they're needed. And so again, uh, they're intended to be provided in the home, in the community. They um, really can be provided, uh, in, in, as, as, as um, Maria said, individually or really in complement with some of the other services that are part of um, these new state plan services array. So CPST can be provided in concert with psychotherapists, similar to the example that was provided uh, earlier around Raymond, or they could actually work um, in close collaboration with a psychosocial rehabilitation worker as well, um, similar to the previous example. So the services can be provided um, in a myriad of ways, again, individualized to the child and family uh, based on an assessment. What is CPST? Um, this is very, this is like lingo, right? So it's basically a, a myriad of interventions that can help support a child and family with the, with the challenges that they're having around a child's, uh, you know, identified behavioral health need that could look, uh, you know, in a, many different ways. Um, but really is intended to help um, help them generally be more successful in in uh, in their school, in their home, and in their community. So how do we do that? How do we do that? CPST has a myriad of ways in which we can do that. There are a varied number of crisis service components, um, which I can't see because I printed out black and white, by the way. Um, but uh, <laughs> but they're there. Uh, intensive in interventions, crisis avoidance, intermediate term crisis management, rehabilitative psychoeducation, strength based crisis planning, and rehabilitative supports. All right, so let's look at each of them. Um, Intensive interventions is a, is a service in which um, can be provided to the child alone or the child and family. Um, it can really uh, help be, it's, it's intended to be, I like these, supportive counseling, solution focused. Um, it's really intended to help create a level of stability, stability and increased functioning uh, with a child to help them uh, work, uh, function well in their, in, again, in their school and community, in their home, and interpersonally with their family, with their siblings, um, and really to help guide families on, on, and children on how best they could um, manage some of the challenges that they're experiencing through, um, through these efforts. Um. 
Crisis avoidance. Crisis avoidance is a preventive intervention wherein the worker can really work with the child and family who potentially has had a history of crisis episodes previously to identify their, uh, the precursors and the triggers in which uh, lead to their crisis episodes and help to actively engage them in some planning and some identification of resources and approaches that could help um, them when they start to feel as though a crisis episode uh, might occur again and how they can avert that, um, how they might be able to identify natural supports or seek other uh, resources and things um, and skills that, that will help them to avert uh, a crisis episode. However, if they do have a crisis episode, the CPST worker can also engage with them in intermediate term crisis management. And this is really a, um, an, a, an opportunity to help to stabilize the child and family um, and to assist in um, uh, addressing the crisis that had occurred and uh, potentially working on um, you know, uh, the, their utilization of some uh, crisis services as listed herein, mobile crisis, emergency room intervention, and, and how um, that child and family could, um, you know, help to uh, address what occurred so that they are stable and follow up with them in, in, uh, in after a crisis episode might have occurred in a more hands-on, uh, supportive, and ongoing way uh, subsequent to that crisis episode. So rehabilitative psychoeducation, these are just long terms. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a flexible way in which a, a CPST worker can really support a, a child in being successful. And there's a wide array of ways in which they can do that by providing uh, uh, education to that young person on how they can better um, um, manage some of the, uh, either the symptoms that they're experiencing or the, uh, the outgrowths of some of the behavioral, social, emotional challenges that they're experiencing and how they can further promote um, community integration. And so there's a wide uh, myriad of, of examples here about how um, the CPST worker can really support a child in, in, um, in, in addressing some of the challenges that they're, they're experiencing, all facets and all life domains uh, of their life. And so, you know, obviously, you know, school or academics, um, family and interpersonal peers, uh, financial management, or, or even just uh, overall uh, importance of understanding um, the, uh, the critical nature of connections and overall health and wellness. Now, strength-based service planning is just that. Um, this is an opportunity for a CPST worker to really work with the child and family to identify strengths, needs, resources, and natural supports um, and develop goals and objectives. It might be that, uh, that uh, a, um, an individual was referred to CPST without going through an OLP, um, and, and the CPST worker does have the capacity to develop a plan with that child and family based on their uh, service planning and their assessment. Um, of that child and family under, the, under their own um, agency supervisory, supervisory structure. Now, CPST rehabilitative supports. Um, these are really uh, very hands-on um, um, kind of skill development and support activities that help individuals really operationalize their rehabilitation and their, re their development of resilience in the course of their, their treatment. Again, all of these services are rehabilitative services, and so we're really trying to address an ongoing need. Um, and so we, they can help somebody, uh, a, a child and, or young person, deal with their daily functioning. Um, and so their, uh, their life skills, um, knowing, knowing more about themselves and, and how to identify what their needs are and to be mindful of their body and be more aware of their own health indicators. When should I uh, contact my physician? Um, if I'm charged, if I'm older and I'm charged with self-administering my own medication, what are the tools and tips and techniques to help me remember these things? Um, you know, this is, again, uh, this is not psychoeducation, so we're not necessarily understanding the side effects of prescribed uh, medication, but we might be acknowledging when we know when our body is having a bad reaction to the medication that we're taking and when we should be mindful of how our body is feeling and know our body well enough to know that that's when we really need to contact a physician. And so it's, again, the rehabilitative supports and guiding people on the skills necessary to, up, to really operationalize almost their the, um, the, the, the treatment that they're engaged in and support them in um, all of these areas. So Henry. Henry is a 15-year-old boy 
who's enrolled in Medicaid managed care. Um, and his and his I see, and his family is experiencing difficulties related to his alcohol and drug use. Um, so he uh, is exhibiting challenges in his daily functioning and his personal growth and his interpersonal relationship um, because of these um, it, it, because of his involvement with alcohol and drugs. And so uh, Henry does attend a group session for teens who who are using drugs and alcohol. But uh, the licensed practitioner who runs this group uh, discerned that uh, Henry really needed some additional supports outside of this group and really feels that he would benefit from CPST services. So um, because this, this uh, counselor who runs the group is actually a licensed practitioner, um, he talks to the, Henry and his family about um, uh, some of the things that he's observing and some of the um, areas in which he feels might be useful and helpful to support Henry in his, in his um, recovery efforts. And so he, ref he um, suggests that, that they uh, explore CPST uh, for the purposes of more psychoeducation. And so uh, the family agrees and the counselor makes a recommendation to CPST services. Um, of course, the counselor ensures that the CPSD provider is in the child's managed care network, um, and he documents the medical necessity to be able to send a written recommendation to the CPSD provider, because um, that's required. <laughs> the CPSD provider is the Maplewood Agency. Uh, they receive and review the recommendation, and they contact the managed care plan and notify them that Henry will begin to be receiving CPSD services with them. And so uh, Henry goes to meet with the Maplewood Agency's CPST worker, and the agency en engages him in uh, some initial assessments, starts working with him to uh, be develop a strength-based service plan, and, um, and helps to identify that really they agree with the licensed practitioner, rehabilitative psychoeducation would be beneficial for him. And so he, they, uh, they en enroll him in the program, and, in, and confirm with the managed care plan that, um, that they are going to be providing services um, from, uh, they confirm with the managed care plan that he's not receiving other, these same services with another provider and they are going to enroll him in their, in their CPSC services. <laughs> um, the CPSC worker meets with Henry for one session and determines that additional services are needed and develops a plan, which is again the psychosocial education. Psycho -re the rehabilitative <laughs> education. Um, and since the provider was able to complete the assessment and plan in one visit, the CPST provider can begin providing psychoeducation services. The CPST provider focuses on psychoeducation to inform Henry and his family about the long-term effects of substance use and assists them in identifying their strengths and implementing strategies to promote and restore a prior level of functioning. Uh, before the fourth visit, of course, though, the CPSC provider undergoes concurrent review by the managed care plan. The medical necessity is uh, substantiated and confirmed with the managed care plan, which authorizes an additional 30 services. And the CPSC provider is able to provide those 30 visits before an additional concurrent review is needed. Pathway to care plus UM. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, uh, Maria, for psychosocial rehabilitation. Okay, so we're going to talk about psychosocial rehabilitation which is the delivery of services in a natural setting, expanding the range of treatment options by allowing greater flexibility and a choice based on the needs of the child, youth, and family caregivers. The services consist, can assist the youth or child in developing and applying skills in natural settings and can help practice operationalized skills that have been identified as part of a deficit on the treatment plan. So some of you are probably wondering, how is this different than some of the things that Meredith just described? So one of the things I would refer you back to is the, the um, family, Children and Families Treatment and Support Manual that we talked about earlier on in this presentation, because in that you'll see different staff qualifications for some of these services. And that's a little bit of, of a segue into why some of these are different. So PSR is meant and designed to restore, rehabilitate, and support the child and youth's developmentally appropriate functioning as necessary for integration as an active and productive member of their family and community. The activities are hands-on and task-oriented. They're focused on rehabilitating the needs of the youth and restoring functioning. And the activities can be provided in co coordination with treatment interventions by a licensed practitioner. So what are these services? So they can be personal, they're really about establishing personal and community competence. 
their social and interpersonal skills, daily living skills, and community integration. So personal and community competences to promote independence, autonomy, and mutual support. Again, remember, these are for zero to 21, so they're gonna be developmentally appropriate skills. Um, develop and strengthen independent community living skills and integration into the community with, again, the goal to restore, rehabilitate, and support. Service components are rehabilitative interventions, individualized, collaborative, and hands-on training to build developmentally appropriate skills. So when I think about some of those things, it might be helping a young person um, learn how to navigate public transportation. It might be um, accompanying them to an after-school practice for a sporting event and helping them learn how to actively participate. It might be that their active participation is the ability to go sit in the stands and remain in the stands throughout that sporting event. So really, it's meant to be individualized based on that child's needs and treatment plan. Social and interpersonal skills. They increase increasing community tenure and avoiding, avoiding more restrictive placements, building and enhancing personal relationships, establishing support networks, increasing community awareness, and developing coping strategies and effective functioning in the individual social environment including home, work, and school locations. So when you think about that, I, I really like the one establishing support networks. It's helping the youth and their caregivers and family think about who else in the community can be supportive of them. So the summer when we were talking, I was talking about one of my friends and how my husband and I can go and have pizza with her and her family and their child with some special needs. And really helping them to see that we can be there to be supportive and help with some of these types of activities. Some folks may not have people like that in their life, but this type of service would help them begin to kind of take an inventory of who are those natural supports in their community. Okay? Daily living, improving self-management of ne negative effects of psychiatric, emotional, physical health, developmental or substance abuse services that interferes with a person's daily living skills. Support the individual with the development and implementation of daily living skills, daily routines necessary to be maintained in the home or in school and work and community. Personal autonomy, learning how to manage stress. So identifying those things that they know might set them off and learning how to self-regulate. Um, unexpected daily events, learning how to overcome those disruptions um, of, and, and understanding how behavioral health and physical health systems um, interact with them so they can build some confidence. It can also be helping them to develop a plan so that they can accomplish what they need to do in the course of a day in terms of managing those stressors and other skills of daily living that can be developmentally appropriate. Next slide. Community inter inter integration. Um, social skills, such as developing interpersonal skills when interacting with peers and establishing and maintaining friendships and building a supportive social network. Health skills such as developing constructive and com comfortable interactions with healthcare professionals and assisting the individuals with effectively responding or avoiding identified precursors or triggers that result in functional impairment. So really maybe with an older adolescent, teaching them how to have a conversation with their healthcare practitioners or prescribers about how they feel about certain medications, what types of symptoms they're having, um, all types of things that occur as a, as a person gets older that can cause anxiety or discomfort or based on um, intellectual challenges may be difficult for them to have, but really helping them to have some of those independent conversations in an appropriate way. Supporting the identification and pursuit of personal interests and hobbies. So making sure that the natural supports that we're developing and the, the work that we're doing with the communities really look at what are their interests, what are their hobbies, and how do we help them to be supportive and inclusive in their communities, whether, whether it be um, in the community at large, their faith-based community, or other types of places that they and their family may be engaged. So Ava is a 17-year-old girl in foster care diagnosed with depression and a history of trauma. She has diabetes and struggles with obesity caused by her antidepressant medication. She was recently enrolled in a health home due to her chronic conditions and in need for service coordination. The health home care manager noted that Ava had difficulty managing her medication and made a referral to Ava's clinic provider to the non-physician non licensed practitioner of the health, licensed behavioral health practitioner to establish a medical necessity criteria and make recommendations. 
The clinic provider conducted an evaluation and determined that PSR would be a beneficial service for Ava. Once, once she went to the PSR section of the agency or the PSR agency, they reviewed the recommendations and determined that Ava's enrolled in, Medicaid, in a Medicaid managed care plan. They contacted the Medicaid managed care plan to notify that they're, that they're the agency of record and they'll be providing services for Ava. So together with Ava, the provider develops a plan and shares this information with the health home care manager to be included in the, Ava's overall plan of care. Next slide. That provider then works with Ava to improve her nutritional awareness, formulate a menu plan, and help her learn how to use public transportation to get to the grocery store that has healthy food options. The PSR provider gives the H health home care manager regular updates who conveys to this to Ava's clinician. And that would be the, the end of the final overview of the first three services that get implemented on January 1st, 2019. Uh, we're going to turn it back over to the MGTAC folks to talk about the resources and links. Yes, and thank you, um, Meredith and Maria, for um, reviewing those service categories. So we have received a number of questions, but prior to beginning our Q&A period, I just want to remind everyone of the available resources. So if you have additional questions after today's webinar, please feel free to email questions and feedback to the um, New York State OMH Managed Care mailbox. Um, and when you do, just make sure that you include the kid system transformation um, in the subject line. Also, in order to make sure you're receiving the most up-to-date information, I encourage all of you to sign up for the following listers, and that way just ensure that you're um, getting, the infor the, getting the information in a timely fashion. Here are some additional resources related to the children's transformation. Um, and the links are provided here. Again, we will be posting this slide deck to our website um, after the presentation, and so you'll be able to um, have access to all the links. And then one last reminder about the upcoming trainings. Again, we will be having a billing update webinar on November 6th and a billing and UM office hours webinar on November 15th. So just uh, make, to look, make sure to look out for the announcement and registration for those events. Um, and now we will begin our Q&A period. So I'm going to ask our um, state partners, um, mm -hmm. would you, um, you've had an opportunity to look at some of the questions. Um, would you prefer a couple of minutes to consider uh, where you want to start with those or are you ready to go? We're ready to go. All right. Um, how would you like to do this? Would you like us to read the questions before we respond to them, or do you want to read the questions? I guess oh, I we'll read the questions. And, yeah, you can go ahead and do that, because then you'll see where you're at in the list of questions. Yeah, when I said it out loud, I realized that which one I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, all right, so um, the first question is, does, does this mean that the referral can be made to the other licensed practitioner who then does the assessment to make the recommendation? And the answer to that is absolutely. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, ways in which um, agencies get a myriad of referrals from a variety of sources in the community. And if, uh, if they've not come with a recommendation from a, a licensed practitioner of the healing arts otherwise, uh, from their primary care physician or from another treating clinician, that, that mental health agency is likely going to be able, going to need to do an assessment. And so they're going to use their OLP to conduct that assessment to be able to discern if the child meets medical necessity for either OLP services or one of the other rehabilitative services of CPST or PSR. And then they're going to be the recommending practitioner if, in fact, uh, um, CPST or PSR is, is necessary. And so that's a wonderful uh, question because it's exactly what we would expect to happen um, when the mental health agency gets a referral from someone who's not a licensed practitioner of the healing arts. Uh, next question is, does the supervisor, LCSW, of an L of a LPHA need to be an employee of the designated agency or can this supervision be contracted out? Um, uh, I'm not sure why an LCSW would need to supervise an LPHA. You might be thinking about an NDLBHP, um, such as a mental uh, licensed master social worker uh, who's under the supervision of. 
or actually it could be a CPST worker or a PSR worker who's also being supervised by an LCSW. But either way, it doesn't matter. Um, the question really is about um, can, does the supervisor have to be an employee of the designated agency or can the supervision vision be contracted out? Um, and what I'd say is there's a, there's a supervision is required, obviously, that's, that's in the manual, um, but how that's achieved um, and how that's provided is uh, up to the agency. We, we're not being prescriptive about that. Um, but uh, if that LCSW is providing services for that agency, that agency, the designated agency is responsible for that licensed practitioner. But, um, but if that person is just providing supervision, how you secure supervision uh, is really um, up to you. We're not being prescriptive. Do you All have right. any other yeah. questions? No, I'm just going to follow it up with another question that's kind of on down. It says, what happens if the OLP right. were to close before the PSR and who's responsible for the treatment plan? So what, I, what I'm thinking I'm, I'm reading here is that, so if I'm the other licensed practitioner and I've been seeing the youth and their family clinically, and I've come to the end of the work that I'm doing with them, but I believe that they could still benefit from psychosocial rehabilitation, can that, can that continue? The answer is yes, and who would be responsible for the treatment plan? Um, there, for each service, there needs to be a, a a small t treatment plan about what's happening in terms of time and intensity and dosage of the services that's being provided, that would still stay in place and that would still need to be overseen by a licensed practitioner of the healing arts, but it might be related to the agency that's providing that service. So if they are the same agency, then that would probably work pretty cleanly. Mm -hmm. If they're not, then to go back to Meredith's comment about clinical supervision and, and whether you contract or don't contract, that's an agency's individual decision. Um, I'm going to stick with a question right under that one that says, if the state, is the state reaching out to hospitals, local health offices, et cetera, to get the word out about these services that will be available and, and the agency is approved to provide these services, or does each agency have to do their own outreach and education? So the state does have a consumer outreach group and we are planning on making sure that folks begin to know that these services are available. However, we would be remiss if we didn't tell agencies that have been designated that um, it is always better that you're responsible for marketing and doing your own outreach about these services and that they're available in your community and how, and how you will provide them and what services you will provide. Yeah. It's always best to bang your own drum so that you can assure referrals and, um, and viability of your program and services. Um, I'm just going to answer this one because I think it's, uh, it, well, it might relate to you too, but uh, who will provide medication management to OLP clients? Um, uh, initially uh, in the billing manual, we did have an exclusion of a concurrent um, OLP and uh, clinic enrollment. Um, we've since removed that exclusion. So um, if a child is receiving um, clinic services um, from and has a therapist, uh, they can get their medication management through the clinic. Uh, and the OLP can be engaged to provide services that are not being provided by the licensed practitioner in the clinic. So they can do family therapy um, and they can engage the client in other services that are not being provided by the clinic practitioner because they are, um, that would be duplicative if they were doing the same, uh, let's say, individual therapy with the, with the child in the clinic as they were doing with OLP. So OLP can be provided for other services such as family therapy um, and things not covered by the clinic. So here's a pretty easy clarifying question and thank you for asking. It says, can each of the individual services be provided to youth under the age of five or only OLP? So we began by talking about how these services are um, under a Medicaid category called Early Screening Periodic Diagnostic and Treatment, which means all of these services as appropriate can be offered to youth or children zero to 21 years of age. So agencies may have um, specialty areas and that goes back to how they market themselves in their community of, of what age groups they work well with. But certainly, if it's appropriate, any of these services could be used for an individual ages 0 to 21 in their families. So I have two questions that are somewhat related. Um, if a child is not in Medicaid managed care, uh, how does this come into play? So if a child is Medicaid eligible or Medicaid enrolled, uh, they are eligible for these services. And if they are not in managed care, 
they can be provided and billed fee for service. The other question is, if not Medicaid, how will it work to bill fee for service? So these services are not available to children who are not enrolled or eligible for Medicaid. Um, this is to me, so I'm just going to answer it. Um, I had said that you can get CPST without going through OLP, um, and, and somebody asked for clarification. Again, any of these services can be provided independently or in collaboration with each other. So a licensed practitioner of the healing arts who's, um, who's not an OLP can recommend these services and, and uh, discern medical necessity for a child and refer them and recommend them uh, to, for CPST services. So a child can get CPST services without having to need to go through OLP if the medical necessity has already been discerned and, um, and um, by another licensed practitioner of the healing arts. So this one is what is the difference between PSR and habilitation under HCBS services and how do we distinguish the difference between these services when choosing one over the other and applying it to a client. So Meredith and Allison, as I understand it when we've talked about this, that the EPSDT services are rehabilitative in nature, so they're meant to restore functioning, and that um, the, the HCBS habilitation services is just that, meant to help develop yeah. services. So if you think about it, in one we're restoring functioning, and in the other one we're trying to improve functioning and, and habilitating the person. Yeah, would agree. Okay. Well, you know, I would defer to Allison. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You're much more mm -hmm. familiar. Uh, just a quick question. Somebody asked, can OLP be used for assessment only? Um, if that's all that's needed, certainly. Uh, but uh, obviously, if the OLP discerns that that child needs ongoing psychotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, they would do that as well. So we, I see a lot of questions in here around treatment planning and OLP and all of the other services and progress notes and treatment plans needed. So um, yes, things need to be documented. Um, and even for psychosocial rehab, that worker would need to document and relate back up to the goals that they've established with that person on each visit. Um, and I would refer you to the manual for some really ongoing documentation about what's required for each of the services. Right. And again, um, we, we've not been prescriptive. We're not giving you a treatment plan. We're not giving you a model for progress notes or case records So, um, at this time. And so um, a, clearly, if you're a licensed provider and you have um, established uh, parameters for these things, I'm sure you can use those to, to carry over for these new services. Um, really interesting question. Uh, question is, could you clarify the firewalls that are needed to be in place between the health home care management and CFTSS programs? For example, can they operate separately under the same department and have a similar supervisor or, um, or there, does there need to be firewalls? So I just want to be clear, um, conflict of interest and firewalls are specific to HCBS services. Uh, and these are state plan services. And so when you provide a state plan service, you're not beholden to uh, conflict of interest uh, um, rules because uh, those are specific to HCBS. So that's not applicable for the services that we're talking about today. So there's also a number of questions um, about evidence-based practices and where are we at with that. Um, in the interest of getting to the implementation of these services and getting out there used, we have not done any more work on evidence-based practices. Um, and again, I would refer you, if, if you have a specific evidence-based practice and you're using it currently and believe that it's, you could do that under um, CPST, I would encourage you to go back and look at the staff qualifications because they vary based on the services being delivered. Um, and then also look at the rate codes and look at how you would make your evidence-based practice fit there. And then if all else fails, you have a primary designated agency that you could reach out to and they can provide some additional technical assistance around that. Um, just some really um, quick questions. 
Um, can each of these services be provided to youth under the age of five? Yes, again, all EPSDT services are accessible for children zero to five, so that applies to OLP, CPST, and PSR. Um, and in, in addition, somebody asked how often is supervision uh, required to be provided? Again, uh, the qualifications of the supervisor is outlined in the state plan manual, the C, I'm sorry, CSTSS manual, um, but we do not dictate um, uh, frequency of, of supervision. Um, that should be determined uh, by the agency. I think we've kind of begun to answer m most of the ones we have. Um, there may be a few others that we haven't, and we could certainly take a look at um, answering them, and I would imagine we'll be posting Q&As. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That, so uh, we'll, we'll be pulling together a list. Uh, so many of the questions have been answered, but there are a few um, that are still remaining, but we have run out of time. So what we typically do um, after a webinar like this is, uh, you know, kind of formalize some of these questions, make sure that the answers are clear, and they will um, come back out in the form of a frequently asked questions or a Q&A document that uh, when that is completed and that has been reviewed will be posted along with the slides on the um, MCTAC website. So before we go today, um, you know, I think Meredith and I would be remiss if we didn't say thank you to the folks at MCTAC as well as the staff around the table because they really do make our job somewhat easier because we come in to present and they've done the, all of the logistical work. So thank you to that team and thank you to all of you who took the time to listen to the webinar today. Ditto. Yes. Thanks. Thanks everyone for attending and hope you have a great day.